out later. Got it. Welcome, everyone. I think you're in the right place. We have an exciting uh, presentation for you today. My name is Vivian White, um, and we'll be welcoming Teresa Summer here in just a minute, who's going to be really leading this, but we're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to roll with it. Um, I want to welcome you to the Big Astronomy uh, webinar for a brand new toolkit that we have just sent to many of you. Um, this is for working with blind and visually impaired visitors. And these, um, well, you'll hear a lot about all of these uh, pieces of the toolkit in just a second. Um, let me see if I can advance. Momentito. Let's see. There we go. This is the overview. We'll just do a few introductions. Uh, we have a lot of people who help to make this happen. Um, hopefully, Teresa will be back in time for the best practices, um, and then we're going to share some of our activities that we created for this toolkit. And if you have questions, I think maybe if you could just stick them in the chat as we go along. And Brian, will you help with that one? Help us kind of field some of these questions. Thank you so much. All right. Um, welcome. Um, we are also waiting for one other person to join us, who is Ken Quinn, who has been an amazing resource for this um, Toolkit. And I also want to mention that Noreen Grice is on here, and we're so happy to have you on here because you were part of the inspiration for this toolkit as well. Noreen um, does a lot of things. Let me see. You've got, uh, I've got many of her books here on my shelf behind me, Everyone's Universe, and a lot of others that she has done. Noreen's been working with the blind and um, low vision community for a long time, um, creating great astronomy activities and planetarium activities. So welcome, Noreen, and thanks for being a part of this. Um, we have one other uh, webinar that we have done before. Noreen had created, had taken some of the original toolkit activities that I'll show you in a minute and created some do-it-yourself versions of those for working with people with visual impairments. And, um, and we have taken some of what she has done and some new ideas and um, created an, a physical toolkit that we have mailed out to a lot of you. So um, I know not everyone has gotten them yet because we just sent them out last week, but we will be um, you should be getting them very soon if you've signed up for them. And if you haven't, give us a minute and there's a place to sign up for them. Um, we'll show you how to do that. So Ken, um, uh, Brian, is Ken on yet? Yes. Yeah. Ken, Ken is on right, on, right after you said his name. <laughs> Hi. Oh, and Teresa's back. Okay, good. I'm back. Yes. And I think I should be good. Yes, I can hear uh, you. I had some technical difficulties, everyone. <laughs> As did we, Ken. <laughs> so it's great to see everyone and, and welcome if I missed that part. <laughs> it's... Go right ahead. I'm going to let you take over, Teresa, because you know what you're doing. Okay. And um, yeah, it's great to see you all. And thanks so much for joining us for this uh, uh, webinar and welcoming blind and low vision folks to your museum or astronomy event. And we are going to talk a little bit um, Vivian, did you do the overview of the talk? And this is this is your section, Vivian. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm gonna. Sorry, I gonna... <laughs> I'm with you. Okay, give me one second. Let's see if that works. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we are. Okay, yeah, I did do the overview very quickly before you got here. So oh, we're... Okay. great. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, Ken, maybe we should welcome Ken. Hi, Ken. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Vivian. Thanks. <laughs> Glad to be here. Great to have you here. Um, I'll do a quick uh, bit of, uh, Ken's got his a whole section, but maybe I'll do a quick introduction. Ken, actually, maybe I'll let you do your introduction, Ken. I think that would be good if we all did our own intros. Okay. All righty. Um, hello, everyone. I'd my name is Ken Quinn. I live in Western Pennsylvania, specifically in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and I live with my wife and three children. Been making astronomy um, accessible to all, including blind and visually impaired communities for over the last 22 years and working in conjunction with AUI as well as NASA um, to make those astronomy materials accessible over the last 22 years. 
Can I just want to say that, Ken, you've been an amazing part of our team and we couldn't have done half of this without you. Um, so thanks for all of your support and input. And then. Oh, you're, you're welcome and I appreciate that. Yeah. And I'm Teresa Summer and I work here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I've been here for seven years now. And I also have worked in a lot of planetariums and museums. And so some of you I know from that realm and others of you I know from ASP, but it is good to see everyone. Um, Vivian, do you wanna do your own intro? Sure, I'll do a quick one. I'm Vivian White. I am the Director of Free Choice Learning at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And, um, and I am just thrilled to get to work with Ken and Teresa and Noreen and lots of other people who have been so helpful on this. This is an exciting new um, area for us to explore at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So um, yeah, it's great to be here. I think I'll just launch right into it so that you all know what we're doing. Um, the big astronomy um, uh, grant that we got from the National Science Foundation was to, to create a planetarium show all about the big telescopes that are um, uh, located in Chile and talk some about why we invest so much money in um, astronomy in Chile in particular. Um, we created a, well, I shouldn't say we, the California Academy of Sciences created an amazing planetarium show that won lots of awards. Um, and it was created in both English and Spanish, which has been a, a nice, um, way to distribute it more widely. It's also been translated into quite a few other languages. Um, and this is available for free in the 2K version. If you're a planetarian, you can also get them in the 4K version. You just have to pay for the hard drive that we use to send it to you. So this is a really lovely resource and it was released right in March of 2020, which you can imagine is not the best time timing for uh, releasing a planetarium show because not a lot of people were in planetariums at that exact moment. Uh, we had other things on our minds, um, but luckily it was part of a big wide suite of uh, materials. And uh, not only was there the show, but we had live events and those went spectacularly well during um, when we were all kind of working from home as much as we could, but a lot of the museums were closed and they were doing online activities. We had a lot of live events that happened with people who were from Chile who could talk to us about what was going on there. Um, uh, we also, the ASP, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific came in and we created some hands-on toolkits, which again, were not ideal during a pandemic, but so we translated some of that into online learning. Um, and I'll show you where to find all of that in a minute. Uh, we're doing a lot of cool research on, um, on well, what started was going to be a big suite of activities, but now it's on how we learn, what we learned during the pandemic, turns out. So that's great. We're presenting that. Um, Abrams Planetarium and Shannon Schmoll are, and her team are doing quite a bit of cool research on that. So that's exciting. And this is all funded by the National Science Foundation um, under the auspices of the um, Associated Universities, Inc., AUI, and ORA and NORLAB now. So um, two of the big things that came out of it, besides the planetarium show, are an educator guide and an informal toolkit. And this informal toolkit has been the inspiration for what we're going to show you today. Um, the initial toolkit um, was really so much fun to make, and it had some pretty cool goals uh, to it. So we, the, the planetarium show talks a lot about um, all the people that it takes to do big astronomy. So uh, it takes everyone from driving, you know, the people who drive the big trucks that move the the detectors all the way through to, um, you know, it also takes a full kitchen of people and it takes a lot of coders and a lots of um, technicians and things like that. So we, we highlighted a lot of the different um, jobs that it took to uh, to do big astronomy. And so that was one of our main goals. And so we have that there. You can see the astronomy, there's space for everyone, talks about a lot of the different jobs. Um, that, And we have a suite of about uh, seven activities that came with the original toolkit, which has been really fun and distributed to amateur astronomy clubs and museums around the world. Um, you can get to that at bit.ly slash big astro or with that QR code there, that should get you to everything you need to know. Um, oops, let's see. Nope, not going to do that either. 
Oh, there we go. Um, and then I was telling you, Noreen is here and she helped us create some really lovely um, materials that helped to visualize our galaxy and, and other things for those visitors that were blind and had low vision. So these are tactile images that are created kind of a do-it-yourself uh, version of some of these activities. The first top left you'll see um, we have um, showing some of the different constellations there uh, and legends in the sky that we've created uh, that we've talked about from around the world. This was one of the original activities that had been um, been used uh, has been modified for use with um, those with low vision and who cannot see. Um, and then also you'll see some where some of these have gone for our newest toolkit. And I'll show you those in just a second. So a big shout out to Noreen. Um, these were really fun and amazing. And we have tested them in many, many places with many people. And I think Teresa is going to talk about that in a second. Um, oh, this is just what I wanted to tell you. The learning goals for the main toolkit were, of course, teamwork, as I just talked about a second ago. Also, why we put the telescopes in Chile, because it's dry and high and um, uh, has a great infrastructure um, and lots and lots of space for um placing large telescopes in uh, great locations. Um, and also that uh, the last goal there would be that we take information in many different forms from all different wavelengths of light and also even detecting with um, gravitational waves and things like that. So a multi-messenger is what they call that um, uh, approach to astronomy. So, oh, last but not least, and this is, um, uh, these are some funny pictures, not what I plan to put up there, but this was <laughs> it, part of um, Chile also. Uh, this is it, honoring some indigenous knowledge and just talking about how astronomy has got a cultural heritage to it that we all share and what um, that has meant to us over the years and currently. So I think with that, I'll oh, maybe just talk about community as the astronomy community day. We have created this kit. Um, in preparation for the Community Day, April 29th, but you can celebrate all month of April. Um, we encourage you to share this kit and the original kit with your audiences. Um, if you'd like to sign up on bigastronomy.org, you can um, you can be entered to win some cool telescopes. You will also get your events posted. Um, they're going to do lots of splashy pages about it and share with everyone what's going on. So um, I encourage you to participate in Community Day or Community Month all April. Um, if you go to the main website, you will find information on that. And with that, I will stop talking and <laughs> pass it back. Thanks, Viv. Um, just one one thing about Community Day that I wanted to mention is that, you know, with everything happening in March of 2020, this is a great opportunity to sort of remind folks of this amazing resource. And you can get the show for free. Um, you can either have it for your planetarium or for your flat screen or whatever you use in your museum or event. Okay, so just moving on to the main portion of the talk, we're gonna talk about best practices and that's for welcoming low vision and blind uh, individuals to your museum. And so, I just wanted to mention that there's 1.3 million legally blind people in the U.S. and uh, one point, um, sorry, 12 million people who have visual damage in their eyes. Um, and so there's a, a large population of the U.S. Uh, that we would like to welcome to our events. And so I just wanted to um, point that out uh, before I turn it over to Ken, who is going to talk specifically about some of the best practices. Well, are you, Teresa, thank you much. Um, do you happen to have access to the slides? If you could tell me what's on that first one there. I don't have access to it. All of my text not working today for some reason. Uh, that's the text and screen readers one. Okay. Um, so screen readers are used by all blind and visually impaired individuals to access any printed information that comes across pretty much any computerized device, whether it be a tablet, a cell phone, or a computer device. Um, it reads what shows up there. So all text, all pictures. However, if pictures aren't labeled, um, 
it will just tell us a graphic number. So if you don't have your pictures labeled, it will say graphic 6,534,292. Um, if you know what graphic numbers means, that gives you at least a little bit of information, but it really doesn't give you the extent of what you're viewing. Um, for more information about that, I would suggest contacting your web designers and they'd be able to best assist you with how to label those. Also, there are links in the toolkit that um, you can go to that will show you best practices on how to do that. Yeah, this whole best practices section is going to really be a lot about um, go and read the best practices section that came with the kit because there are um, links to different accessibility tools that can help you you see. Um, it just points out specifically what's what's needs to be adjusted for to make your website more accessible. Correct. And if people have heard of alternate text or alt text before, what I just previously spoke about is totally different than alt text. Um, so I would definitely take a look at the toolkit for that. No. And I just put in there graphics need to be labeled like the buttons that you push to go to a certain um, page or something that also needs to be labeled, which I didn't, um, I hadn't thought about before. Also, Even if it's a button for like your cart or a submit button, if you have a form for a sign up for a field trip or something like that, um, anything that you would visually see needs to be a labeled. Exactly. And we're going to make these slides available and we're also recording this. So uh, you'll have lots of opportunities to check this out. Vivian, you want to go to the next slide, which is about setting up the space when you're having an event. Um... Yep. So setting up the space is crucial. If you're going to have um, stuff in your facility that you're going to want the participants to manipulate, and especially if they're on table, have them in trays so they can't roll around. When you are talking to a person who's visually impaired or blind, you always want to refer to the face of a clock when referring to where things are placed on that tray. For example, the clay is in the upper right hand corner, your string is at six o'clock. Um, every single person that's blind or visually impaired has been oriented to the face clock. And we use that in orientation of multiple things throughout our day. So we're very familiar with it. Um, also, if you have signage or anything that you want them to know about, you know, tell them where it's at, just don't say over there. Um, give specific directions, go five feet and then turn right and you'll find it approximately five feet up on the wall. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Vivian. You and just, about, yeah, you kind of just, just go ahead. You just did a little about the etiquette um, where we want to. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so other, other types of etiquette would be always to talk to the person who's visually impaired or blind directly. Don't talk to their friend or whoever might be with them. Um, they can hear you, they just can't see you. Um, and they're personally able to communicate and tell you your, their needs that they need to. Um, when you come into a room, say, you know, Mr. Jones, hi, I'm, you know, Janet, the front desk officer. How can I help you? If you have to leave for some reason, let them know that you're leaving. And when you come back, let them know that you're back. Great. Next slide. This one is about how do you recognize a blind person uh, when you're there in your museum or event? Do we have any other bullet points on that, Teresa? Yeah, we have uh, cane and guide dog glasses and eye fog. Um, so not every single blind or visually impaired person will look the same um, as the world is an individual, so is the blind and visually impaired community. Um, if somebody is standing there without a cane or a guide dog, it's a possibility that they are just visually impaired. Um, they may need to walk up to an item to see it closely, but that's maybe all the need that they need. Um, other times they might be wearing glasses due to the fact that they have some eye shadowing issues or issues with what's called photophobia or light fatigue. Um, 
So, you know, just take that into account if you are seeing someone that's like that. Also, um, you know, a real big indicator of somebody who's standing there with a guide dog or a cane. You never want to grab a person's cane out of their hand or even touch the cane while they're using it. And same thing goes with the guide dog. You never want to touch them while they're working, even if they're just standing there still. A good rule of thumb is if a guide dog, and this goes for any type of service dog, if they have a harness on, they are working and should be considered working and ignored. Um, best rule of thumb is to ask the handler before you touch their dog, because the dog and the handler is a team. They both rely on each other. I'm just thinking as if from the visually impaired perspective and the guide dog is their eyes. So would you like somebody to come up and touch your eyes as you're walking down the center of a street? I can assume you probably wouldn't. So it's kind of the same, same thought process for the visually impaired and our guide dogs. Thanks. And then um, you wanted to talk about universal design a little bit. Yeah, um, when setting up your locations and also your exhibits, um, I would use universal design principles. So just when we talk about making a facility universally designed for all to be able to use, same thing goes to with regards to setting up interactive stations or anything that you're going to have in your exhibit. So best thing is to look at your exhibit, look at what you want to have come out of that for the participants, and then say, can everybody do this? Um, and if somebody can't see, can they do that? And I've had people before say, well, how can I do that? I don't know any tasks or tools or how you know every single blind person can access this. And I say to them, okay, well, if you if you never knew what you were coming up to and you came up to it with your eyes totally closed, would you be able to do this? And sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. And when they say no, then they go back to their drawing board and they figure out how could I do this if I couldn't see it? So that is just one example of a universal design. Thanks. And um, then- um, In specific for astronomy, say you're going to do a presentation about the Big Dipper and you had a visually impaired person come into your dome, you could simply take a paper plate and with either a drill bit attached to a drill or even just a nail, poke some holes in the paper plate and they could at least feel the Big Dipper and follow along with your presentation. Thanks. Um, you also wanted to talk about large print and braille. Um, whenever possible, have large print and braille available, um, just as you would have regular documentation available for the public. If you have the ability to have it on hand, you should. Large print is considered no less than 18 point font. Um, and braille is just a standard, standard braille font. There's actually no font like there is in print for braille. Um, there's something called the Unified English Braille Code, which everything nowadays is produced in. Um, there used to be multiple codes, um, but that went out the window about, I believe, roughly five years ago now. Um, so now everything's in Unified English Braille Code, and every single blind or visually impaired person that reads Braille is able to understand it and read it. Um, and it kind of goes back to that thought process of universal design. Um, so if we're going to have it in print for the normal public to read and access, we should have it also in large print and in Braille. Thanks. Um, we were going to do a section on audio descriptions, but I just put the link in there because mm -hmm. I think that that's something that would be great for you to explore on your own. But um, unless you want to do it now, Ken, I feel like we've had a lot of technical difficulties and I <laughs> don't want to put um, if you. If you think we could pull it off, I'd be willing to do it now, but I still want to pose the question. I'd be um, willing to receive um, responses is why is audio description um, in media important? 
Would you guys like to answer that in the chat? Why you think that um, this description, audio description in media is important? And I'll let you know. And I'll I haven't heard anything come across the chat yet, but. <clears throat> and we'll put some of those samples in the chat as well. Give us just a second. The question Ken you said was why do you think it's important? Correct. Myra said that people need to follow a visual narrative as well. Yeah. And Mary says to make it things more accessible for everyone. Kim mentions to be inclusive. Inclusive, yeah. All good points. Um, mainly because what you don't get to see um, visually, you lose a lot out of. Um, so it does add context to the dialogue like one person just stated in the chat, um, but it gives you what you're missing visually. Just think if you were watching your uh, movie or show that you'd like to watch on TV, all the visual cues and actions that happen, if you could not see that you would miss out on. And it oftentimes changes the meaning of what you're hearing, both verbally as well as the sound effects. So wherever it's possible to do so, you should always have audio description. Um, I know that's not always possible everywhere, but there are ways to do it for very inexpensive as well. Um, also kind of going on that same hand, wherever it's possible and probable, it's always good practice to have closed captioning um, and when possible live um, sign language available. And Noreen, I just uh, watched your other presentation about um, accessibility and best practices. And I thought if you had, if you wanted to jump in, you did a great description of um, the Big Dipper that you might use while you're in the planetarium and sort of doing um, in the live sections of your show, uh, just um, describing things visually instead of just pointing with the pointer um, to say, and I'm gonna paraphrase this, but Noreen, like I said, if you're, you're welcome to join in, um, that you want to say that there are seven stars and that they make the shape of a ice cream scoop where there's a scoop on the four stars um, on the bottom and then that there's a handle that is going that was made up of three stars and um, that it's in the north portion of the sky. Since Maureen's not jumping in, that's that's about the best as I can remember. Um, yeah, I, I want to say you hit the nail on the head right there, Teresa. Um, more descriptive than pointing and saying, you know, star A, B, C, and D, and actually being really descriptive. Yeah, it's it's kind of the same thing with don't say over there, <laughs> right? You want to say exactly yeah. right, you know. Um, so I think that, that that can be a big help that we can do for free in our planetarium shows at most places have live segments. So something- uh, Noreen just put in the chat that pictorial descriptions help everyone. I definitely would agree with that. Um, think about if you're doing a presentation for, you know, school age kids, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, you're gonna relate whatever they're seeing in the night sky to something that they're, they already know. Exactly. Um, and we have one last slide about the best practices, and I'm not sure if um, we said this in the beginning, but um, if you have questions, put them in the chat, jump on, let us know, um, because there's a lot of different sections we're going to be covering. Um, but this just says not all people who are blind and um, visually impaired are the same. So um, there's a lot of individual um, Differences, as Ken was saying, between uh, people who are legally blind and people who have impairment, and um, it's best to just ask the person. Yeah. Can... Yep. Best to just ask, and you know, there's a difference too between legally blind and totally blind. 
Um, so pretty much anybody who wears glasses um, to an extent, depending on what their vision is without glasses could be labeled as legally blind. Um, totally blind normally means you have no vision or very little usable vision. Um, and sometimes no vision at all with the exception of only light perception. Thank you. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think we covered it Covered it all. Um, you know, open for questions, of course. Great. Um, so I'll just keep looking in the chat, but I'm going to move on to the activities that are in the actual kit. Uh, here's a picture of some of them in front of you. We're going to talk about the three activities. Um, one is called In a Different Light, which is about that multi-wavelength spectrum. There's Losing the Night, which is about light pollution and um, why telescopes are in Chile. And then um, Legends in the Sky is about um, the, the constellations and um, the cultural connections that different people have with the sky. And so um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, there's a couple of commonalities that each activity has. Um, if you look, there's like a, a big print guide to each for the visitor that uh, anyone can read. And we do big print so that um, low vision folks can see it. Um, there's also a separate piece that's not in this picture, but everyone has a uh, presenter information. So that's specifically looking at um, the tips that you can use to share this information. And then I'm going to show the materials as well. Next slide. Teresa, can I um, jump in here for one question? One moment. Yeah. I saw a question come through the chat. Mm -hmm. um, the differences between, I believe it was between all text and um, labels is that all text describes the major things that are in a picture. So for example, if you had a picture that showed a desk with Helen Keller in it, her teacher Ann Sullivan sitting next to it, a bunch of stuff on her desk and what they were wearing, you wouldn't want to put that whole description into the alternate text. It's a um, total overload for the screen reader to read, for the blind or visually impaired person to listen to and comprehend. So you want to put in the major bullet points. Um, so for that example, you'd put in, um, you know, Ann Sullivan and her student. You could even name her student if you wanted to, sitting at a desk, um, along with, and you could put several of the items that were listed on the desk, for example, a typewriter. Um, and pen. Um, so then with labeling your website, you would go a different route. Um, best practice is to talk to your web designer, but it's actually labeling buttons and pictures that are on there that have an actual name to them. So for example, it'd be cart, um, submit, different buttons like that. So that's the main differences between that and alt text. Thanks. And if you um, find, if you have a question that pops up also that like after about best practices, we are going to have time at the questions uh, and for questions at the end. So I just wanted to let you know, there's also, a, I want to mention that uh, the Vivian put in the chat that there's a we did 30 point for these activities. It, um, it limits the information that you can put, um, which is actually kind of a neat feature in a way because you really wanna, it really brings your focus down to what you wanna communicate. Um, and I think that um, that's a way that um, doing accessible activities are beneficial for everyone because it really helps you hone in on the messages you wanna share. So, um, as we get into this activity in a different light, um, I want to talk about the types of light. Um, I'm sure you all know about them, but like the wavelength and electromagnetic spectrum are complex topics. So we just use types of light in this activity. And I just want you to be able to judge it for your audience. Um, this is, you know, geared towards families and, and younger um, kids, but uh, you never know what 
people are interested in learning, right? Um, but the questions that we ask are also about everyday use of different types of light, like microwaves or for cooking food, um, not specialized use, um, but uh, as I said, you know your audience best. So, um, and I wanna encourage you, of course, you probably know this already, but asking questions is a great way to get people to talk about what they know and to find out their um, level of sophistication. So what we start the activity with is just asking, have you heard about the types of visible, of light beyond the visible? And you can probably read because it's such big print that even in this picture, you can see what we said. Next page, please. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so the goals of this are just that there's many different types of light and the visible spectrum is just a small part And you can read the rest of them, but I wanted to show you um, this image, which also Vivian showed because it was one of the activities that Noreen shared um, some ideas about how to make it more accessible. And we ended up using a lot of those to make what we call a thermoform. So you'll um, be seeing this, if you haven't already gotten the kit, you'll be seeing it shortly. Um, but this is the different information. And so I'm going to just quickly change over my camera. I hope that this works and we don't have too much issues, but we'll see. It looks like you might still have your background on, Teresa. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. So let's see if that works a little bit. It's kind of foggy. So let me see if I still have the blurred background. There you go. That Great. looks <laughs> So this is the visual image. This is, comes with the kit and it has the different information from the different telescopes. ALMA, which is the radio waves and um, is mentioned in the show and has a, because it's based in Chile. And um, then Hubble, which is visible, of course, and then following the X-ray is from Chandra. And so you can see that each of these different telescope images make a complete image that has the information from the different wavelengths. And that's what we want to get across is that each type of light can give us new information about our universe. So this is a translation that we did into these thermoforms. And so if you look at this, this is the key. And at, um, one thing that you should know about this activity is that Braille is always on the top. So this information on the top should um, is the saying, here's a key. Um, and it's about and it's about different textures. And so each of these different textures represents a different telescope. This one here that's sort of a, a little bit bumpy is a um, image of the ALMA telescope. And then there is the um, Hubble visible and the um, kind of mesh one that represents the x-rays. And so we're going to just scoot over to the other one, which is the compilation image. So again, Braille's always on the top. And then here you can see the completed image that has, uh, when you feel it, you can feel the different levels from each radio telescope from the um, visible and x-ray. So it's a tactile um, information that you can share. So I'm just gonna put these here in case anybody has any questions about those. And also I'm gonna switch back to the other camera. Okay, so we're back. Um, next slide, Vivian, I think this one is for you. I think so too, okay, excellent. So um, uh, thank you so much. Um, if you don't have these in front of you, you can create them yourself. We, do, we did um, work with Noreen and she helped us create um, the the version the do-it-yourself version so if you don't have the tactiles in front of you you can also make it yourself and we have all that up on line we'll put that link in the chat again 
Um, all right, but this one we actually took, um, we great minds think alike because Teresa and I had been working on an activity testing with some local um, audiences on light pollution. And one of the themes in the toolkit was understanding um, why dark skies are better for seeing the night sky. And um, so this turns out there was also, I, I well, you can see it right there, but um, the survey, the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute um, community had been putting together this exact book, which was very much like what we wanted to do. Um, it was written and edited by David Hurd and Cass Runyon and Joseph Minifra and Ken, our very own Ken. So the four of them worked together to create this really cool tactile version um, of urban versus rural skies. And um, we simply added those initial sheets that you can use to help present it in the planetarium or museum. So in the same way that we had um, those sheets, the public facing sheets for the first activity, we also had them for this one. Um, let's see. Uh, and <laughs> this was our original one that we went from city skies where there are very few stars. In this case, this is Orion, for those of you who know this constellation, to a suburban sky, to a rural sky, and how much more detail you can see, how many more of these skies of these stars that you can see in a rural sky. Um, uh, but this one, so uh, the book that is the light pollution book has not just Orion, but it's also business in there. So you can use it all year long in the Northern hemisphere. I think there's somebody who's got some noise coming through. Um, if one of y'all could help with that, that'd be awesome. Um, so uh, this was just a, a new write-up uh, using a very cool new resource um, that's also available. So thank you so much, David Hurd and team, uh, for creating this. It's been a really fabulous resource. So um, yeah, th those are the basics for that. Um, I think I'm going to let you go on to the next one, Teresa, which is the last of the three activities that we used. Yeah, we're going through these pretty quick. So again, if you have questions, just jump on and let us know. And so um, Legends in the Sky is the one that's really about um, how humans have, through the ages, sat around the campfire, looked at the sky and saw and saw the sky and made meaning in it. Um, so that's kind of the big takeaway. Uh, we also have that constellations are made up of a group of stars that are form a pattern. That's our, uh, that's a science standard. And also it's a, a, a kind of astronomy um, from the Greeks or uh, classical definition of uh, constellation. This activity expands that definition a little bit. Uh, next slide. And so uh, a couple of notes that I want to share, and then I'll show you the image, the activity a little bit on the other camera. But um, one of the things that, actually, let me show you them first, and then that'll make more sense. Hold on. Going to... uh, it's still showing me. Let me switch to the other one. And I have to take off my background. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, this is our big print sign. It has the same um, 30 font, right? And um, what we really want to encourage visitors to do is to think about why cultures around the world have had different sky legends and why uh, why that's been important. A lot of times people uh, emphasize their local animals and the climate that they're in. And so um, one of the um, constellations in Chile tells people to um, leave the desert and go up to the mountains during different times of the year. Um, so. Teresa, here. do you want to hold it a little bit closer to the camera? That would be helpful. Uh, yes, thank you. So this is kind of this is has both cited activity, cited words, and then also um, braille that you can feel underneath it. Uh, don't know if I can. A little bit lower. We can't see the top of it. Thanks. Yeah. 
Great. So there's, I just, well, I'm just trying to show that there's like braille on the page. And so you can feel these outlines of the constellations on uh, the right. And then um, that tells a little bit about the, the idea behind the constellation, but it also has the star field so that you can compare both the star field and what each culture has made of that star field. And so there's different ones that highlight different um, interpretations. And for those of you in Tasmania, I am so sorry, we have used here the Big Dipper, which is a Northern Hemisphere um, asterism. So the Dubé is the set of stars that, I'm sorry, this is gonna be harder for Southern Hemisphere observers, I apologize. Yeah, um, unfortunately we had to um, use, a, use a constellation that was visible to the folks in the US because the kit is geared towards the US, but um, in the original interpreted legends, we had constellations for the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, check that out. Um, I'm gonna switch over again. I wanted to mention too that the the original activities are in both English and Spanish, so that's um, helpful for those of us, those of you in Chile and um, Spanish speaking um, countries too. Good point. Thank you. And I also had um, so yeah. Let's get back to the some of the points that I wanted to make, which is that. We only have the shape of the constellation with a little bit of information. We don't, it's not our story to tell. It's not the, our legend to tell. So we don't have that part. Um, and that's really important because each group of indigenous people have their own ideas about what's going on in the sky. And that's why we call it legends. We don't call it stories or fables because there's more to it than that. Um, a lot of different cultures have their ancestors up there or they it's part of a large belief system. Um, and so we wanna respect uh, indigenous knowledge and, and you, we use that word legend. Also, um, as I was mentioning about constellations, um, there's lots of other parts of the sky besides stars that, um, that different cultures use, for example, um, Again, in the Southern Hemisphere, there's like dark patches and light patches of both the Magellanic Clouds, the coal sack, the things that are down in there in that section of the sky. And so they make their sky patterns with um, the spaces in between the stars and the, um, the, the objects that they can see. And so it's really about the location and the culture and the people. And again, that's one of the things we want to share is um, like um, what you would know, uh, um, like what, I'm sorry, let me just think about this for a second because I had it here and I um, can't access that. But um, we want to be able to have folks think about what's important to them and if if they know any sky legends, they can share that with the group that they're at. Also, um, who would they honor with a place in the sky? So that's gonna be very um, special and meaningful to the group that you're with, the visitors. Um, also in the um, activity guide, we have a, a really great um, idea of a constellation, which is that, um, Zion National Park is in Utah, while the Sombrero Galaxy is in the constellation Virgo. And um, that, and we also talk about how uh, the classical um, 88 constellations that we use as roadmaps for the sky. Next slide. Questions. I was hoping we would have about 10 minutes for this. We only have five, so I'm gonna, um, turn off the recording now and just open it so that um, we can see each other and <coughs> if you want to turn on your camera you're welcome to do that and
Um, Brian, could you stop the recording?